Okay, so hello and welcome to the first of our Trends webinars. My name is Felix David, Managing Editor of Trends in Neurology and Men's Health, a bi-monthly publication that focuses on providing high quality material for healthcare professionals on all aspects of men's health. Here with me today, I have Alan White, Emeritus Professor on Men's Health from Leeds Beckett University. Um, we also have Professor Mike Kirby, Editor for Trends in Neurology and Men's Health, and Dr. Patricia Chartow, GP at Hampstead Practice London and Academic Lecturer at University College London. Hello. To give an overview before we begin, the subject of this webinar is very timely and focuses on the current COVID-19 pandemic, specifically the high mortality seen across the globe in men infected with the virus. The speakers are going to go over the early research that has emerged into some of the biological explanations for the higher mortality. The agenda will begin with an overview of COVID-19 in men from Allen, with Patricia then giving an explanation of the ACE2 receptor and its relationship with the virus, before Mike and Allen take us through the role of testosterone, endothelial dysfunction, and the male immune system on the severity of the COVID-19 infection. So, Alan, I think I'm ready to pass it on to you if you're ready. Yes, thank you very much. And um, Mike and I have a paper out on the biological factors in, the, in this month's um, Trends uh, uh, Journal. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so it, it, what we know about uh, COVID is remarkable uh, disease. It's a disease that has developed so fast and has gone right across the world. Currently, there's about 11.8 million cases. Uh, we know that there's over half a million deaths. Um, and, and the knowledge that has been developed around this disease is growing exponentially. That Currently on PubMed, there are 30,000 papers uh, that have specifically focused on to COVID-19. So that's within the last six, seven months. If we look at uh, the, the situation within England, um, we can see from the Public Health England weekly coronavirus uh, reports that um, in terms of testing, um, we have uh, more women identified as having the disease, both through hospital testing and through community testing uh, with 85,799 women um, in, in the hospital testing. That may in part be because they're, they're testing hospital staff as well. So that includes the nursing staff. And interestingly, when you look at the over 60s, uh, the, uh, a male excess emerges until you get to the 80 plus. In the community side, again, you see a, a preponderance for female test, uh, for uh, females being tested. Uh, and, and actually that also, uh, again, uh, is for a lot of the uh, female carers. Um, uh, but it begs the question when you start to look at the mortality around this, whether we're under testing men in the communities. Next slide, please. Uh, when we look at the positivity uh, of the tests, um, especially when you look at the, the weeks 14, 15, which was the, the peak of the infection, we see that more men are picked up, maybe 50% of the men uh, um, uh, have an overall positivity in the tests that have been conducted. Could we have the next slide, please? Now, when we get to mortality, this is where we see the male um, issues emerging. Um, and we've, we've got two slides, one which is looking at uh, 1 to 39, and then the next one which is looking at the older age. Now, in the uh, previous slide, you'll have seen that actually we have about a 50% higher risk of mortality in men, even in the younger ages. And we tend to think of COVID as being a disease of older people, but even in the younger ages where the numbers are smaller, we're seeing a male excess. Could we have the next slide, please? And, and when we look at the 40 pluses, we see the numbers rise exponentially, uh, certainly once we get into the older years, um, but the male excess continues. And up to 84, uh, age 84, uh, we've, we've got over 60% higher risk of, of mortality. Um, uh, and it's only over the age of 85, um, 90 that we see the female excess. And if you actually look at the rates, the rate of death is still higher in the men. Next slide, please. Uh, what we see in terms of critical care, uh, again, this is where, again, men have a, 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 a marked disadvantage in that they're much more likely to be represented within the uh, uh, critical care setting with severe disease. Um, and of the nearly 10,000 people that have, been gone, have gone through intensive care, 70% of those are male. Could I have the next slide, please? 
We also know that inequalities feature strongly with regard to uh, this disease. Um, and here we see the uh, um, uh, mortality mapped against uh, the levels of deprivation, index of multiple deprivation. Uh, and we see that in the uh, for male excess are across the board, but we also see a, a faster rise in male excess um, by deprivation. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, we, this has also been reflected within the occupations. Very interesting analysis being done around uh, risk of death by occupation. And we can see that uh, uh, a lot of the um, uh, most vulnerable men are in the low skilled elementary occupations, which again maps onto the uh, uh, living in the, the poorer areas of society um, and, and the uh, carrying and leisure occupations as well. Can I, next slide, please. Ethnicity has also been a significant factor in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and if you look at the uh, people admitted through intensive care, you see um, about half of the ones that have been uh, admitted are um, of non-white ethnicity, which in terms of the overall demographic profiles means that they're massively overrepresented within the intensive care severely ill uh, population. Can I have the next slide, please? And when that's mapped against um, uh, deprivation, you can see the non-white ethnicity uh, more heavily represented uh, in the, in the uh, populations in intensive care. Can I have the next slide, please? And that's passing across to Patricia. Okay. Um, in the previous slides, Professor White highlighted that in terms of ICU admissions and death rates, males have been affected more severely than their female counterparts. In order to understand the male response to the virus, next slide please, and some of the explanations for the higher fatality rates in men compared to women, we need to take a brief look at the renin angiotensin system. So the renin angiotensin system is well known, not least because its end product, angiotensin II, has various deleterious effects. It's vasoconstrictive, pro-inflammatory, and pro-coagulation, as well as having a role in increasing blood pressure. We know it's generated from angiotensin via angiotensin I, and it includes two enzymes, and that's renin and ACE. There are many ways of interfering with the system to reduce those deleterious effects, such as ACE inhibitors and blockers of angiotensin II. And we know these are primarily used in patients with hypertension, heart failure, and diabetic nephropathy. However, the body is quite skilled at getting rid of angiotensin II, and many enzymes help degrade it. And one of those really helpful enzymes is ACE II which produces metabolites, and you can see that on the very right, and they are called angiotensin 1 to 7. And it's been postulated that angiotensin 1 has beneficial effects which oppose the deleterious effects by angiotensin 2. It's in fact vasodilatory, anti-inflammatory, and has a role in glucose hemostasis, lipid metabolism, energy balance, and it's both cardio and neuroprotective, as well as having positive effects in reducing lung injury, and kidney pathology. Next slide, please. But what is the relevance of the renin angiotensin system in relation to COVID-19? The angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2, is the main route the coronavirus 2, COVID-19, takes to enter the cells, which was also the case for coronavirus 1. ACE2 is quite widespread. For example, it's present in the lungs, heart, kidneys, the lining of the blood vessels, the stomach and intestine, the brain, and in the testes. It's thought to be more highly expressed in smokers and obese patients, which may explain worse outcomes in those patient groups and why they are more at risk. The interaction between the virus and ACE2 leaves it depleted. So the body really loses the positive effects of angiotensin 1 to 7, and the damaging angiotensin 2 effects remain unopposed. Next slide, please. So a study in the European Heart Journal showed that men have higher ACE plasma concentrations than women. And it's been postulated that ACE2 is more highly expressed in tissues in males. So there's more opportunity for the virus to enter the cells. The ACE2 gene is located on the X chromosome. 
And as females have two X chromosomes, they have twice the capacity to form the enzyme and tend to create two types of the ACE2. As males only have one X chromosome, they also have only one form of ACE2. So if the virus can unlock the single form of the male ACE2, it has access to every cell in which the enzyme is present. In summary, the higher ACE2 levels in males combined with the single form that's present may make it much easier to get infected. And once they are infected, they may have less ACE2 and therefore angiotensin 1 to 7 available to help counter the damaging effects of angiotensin 2. As mentioned, the ACE2 is also highly expressed within the testes and the prostate. And Professor, Professor Kirby will discuss this next, including the role of testosterone in the male response to the virus. Thank you, Patricia, <clears throat> for that kind introduction. May I have the next slide, please? Yes. Let me just set the scene, first of all. We know that several age-related conditions are associated with increased rates of hypogonadism, notably type 2 diabetes, obesity, coronary heart disease, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, obstructive airways disease, HIV, and those men taking long-term opiates. Within these groups, secondary hypogonadism has been shown to be associated with increased all-cause mortality, particularly cardiovascular mortality. And we also know that there are many publications where patients have been treated with testosterone replacement therapy to restore testosterone levels to normal. These have shown significant reduction in hospitalization and all-cause mortality in men with coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, heart failure, CKD, kidney disease, Obstructive airways disease and opiate use. And the next slide, please. Now, the thing with this virus is that SARS CoV 2 infects lung alveolar epithelial cells using, as you've heard already, an entry receptor on the ACE2. ACE2 plays a role in lung protection, and therefore, viral binding to this receptor may deregulate a lung protective pathway. Interestingly, studies show that ACE2 is a constituent product of adult type Leydig cells, thus implying a role in testicular function and suggesting a possible involvement of the testicles in COVID infected patients. This is a factor which may affect the secretion of testosterone. And there are several studies which show that men admitted with COVID-19 have significantly lower testosterone levels than men with other acute hospital admissions. And the next please. Now, hypogonadism is associated with increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is one of the reasons that it's deleterious for the circulatory system. Testosterone treatment reduces interleukin-1 interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, which are inflammatory markers associated with the demonstrated cytokine storm in seriously ill COVID patients. COVID infection facilitates the induction of endothelial dysfunction in many organs, but especially the vascular tree. We know that endothelial disease <coughs> leads to uh, uh, vascular disease. So in theory, drugs that improve endothelial function, such as daily PD-5 inhibitors, an area for research, I believe, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and statins could be very important in these patients. And there's been a recent study, which is in the reference list, showing that statins treatment in these patients when they're seriously ill improves the improves and reduces the risk of mortality on the next slide. And here you see a paper published only, I believe, yesterday from the American Heart Association saying, showing the death rate in men treated for hypertension hospitalized with COVID infections. If they're on an ACE or an ARB, they have a significantly reduced death rate, 3.7% compared to the patients treated with other 
treatments for hypertension, 9.8%. And the next slide. So the question I'm asking is, should we be measuring testosterone levels and should we be treating them in these men presenting with serious infection and a low testosterone? I've demonstrated that the virus is associated with severe primary hypogonadism occurring in addition to the functional secondary hypogonadism associated with those probing for conditions such as diabetes or heart disease. Unfortunately, we don't know the baseline levels in these patients. These recent studies raised the question as to whether men should be treated acutely with testosterone to boost resistance to the cytokine storm associated with COVID-19 infection. And this should be an area, an important area of research at this very moment. Consideration needs to be given to those men, the hypergonadal population, with comorbidities who now may have survived the current pandemic, but may be at considerable risk from a second and third wave infection or future viral pandemics. And we should be identifying these men in our communities. However, nothing is straightforward in medicine. And in contradistinction from this, androgen deprivation therapy has been suggested on the basis of reported improval of survival of COVID-19 in men with prostate cancer. And this also is an area of active research at the moment. I do not believe this is likely to be successful, however. And in addition to that, uh, for the reasons I've explained already, but in addition to that, what would be the impact of uh, using ADT in terms of increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes in these men? We need to look into this in some detail. And there, I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mike. I think now it's uh, back over to you, Alan. So now we um, turn to look at the immune system. We've already seen that the, there is a complex biology behind that uh, um, risk of uh, men and uh, COVID-19. Let's uh, want to see what, what the role of the immune system has within that. Could I have the next slide, please? It's been long recognized that uh, women have uh, a more enhanced immune system um, and in the 17th century William Harvey demonstrated that female mice uh, had a stronger immune response uh, than male mice. Um, and I suppose though what, what's been emerging more recently is that this is far more complex than previously thought and there's a whole range of complex interactions amongst the sex hormones, the sex chromosomes and the immune response genes. And uh, the hypothesis is that, that if you look back, why would there, there be a need for a stronger immune system within the female? And that perhaps that in the reproductive years where we see this most evident, um, that um, the, the woman has to be in a fit enough state to, to conceive, to, to carry a child and then to raise the child. Whereas the, the man's energy uh, levels have, have been put into fight flight uh, and to, to the um, development of, 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 of a strong gene pool through, through reproduction. So uh, it, they didn't want to, they didn't need to have as, as a stronger re immune response to disease, uh, whereas the women did. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So we, we know that there's many mediators of the immune response. It, it, it's not just the biology, there's the smoking, as already been mentioned, the comorbidities, the diabetes, obesity, uh, uh, and exposure rates. And we've seen that through the workplace and through the living conditions, uh, social behavior, physical activity, sedentary lifestyle, habitat. But, but we're still seeing that there is a male excess. Once all those factors have been taken into consideration, we're still seeing the male excess, which has been partly explained by the ACE2 uh, uh, um, discussion by Patricia and by the testosterone. But there may well be some more hormonal uh, factors that uh, we should explore. Can I have the next slide, please? If we, if we look at the normal route to infection um, and, in, and the immune response, we see that the uh, bacteria in um, viral infections get in through the SARS-CoV-2 that gets into the body through the ACE2 receptor. 
Uh, and that uh, then stimulates the major histocomplex ability complex uh, which stimulates the T lymphocytes, the CD8 and the CD4. And, and the CD4 T lymphocytes, they help the T cells uh, subdivide into Th1, Th2, producing the cytokines um, and um, the interferon gammon, which is uh, uh, more of the uh, uh, um, more of the uh, um, messenger, uh, getting the stimulation uh, and the interleukins. And the CD8 T cells, the cytotoxic cells, uh, the killer cells. Now, um, what we found with the, the virus is actually there may well be a, uh, um, because of the higher ACE2 uh, representation expression on the lymphocytes, we're getting uh, greater damage through to the uh, lymphocytes, and, and most people who are admitted have got a lymphopenia, um, and um, which is also an impairment in the function of the CD4 and its depletion of the CD8. Uh, the other side of the innate uh, body response is uh, through the epithelial cells, the alveolar macrophages and the dendritic cells. Um, and um, the, the um, uh, COVID has been found to actually mask itself uh, um, through um, the, the glycogen um, uh, um, shielding to stop the body's innate immune system identifying itself, uh, identifying the virus and, and limiting the immune response. Could I have the next slide please? So uh, the female immune response uh, it, it has been identified as being um, much more um, effective uh, at dealing with viruses. This, is, this has been seen in a number of studies and reviews that have been done recently, uh, Cadell and Corvats and uh, um, Klein studies, um, where we're seeing that the uh, estrogen has a, a regulatory function of the myeloid cells and the innate lymphocytes and, and in dampening the uh, um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. We're also seeing that oestrogen has a direct effect on the metabolic fu functioning of the cell, which actually has, uh, um, uh, can limit the, the viral replication. Um, and oestrogen also promotes the uh, type 2 responses of the alveolar macrophages and the resolution of the immune responses to the virus. Um, uh, the uh, expression of the uh, total uh, um, receptors uh, so like receptors, the TLRs, are, um, are also more expressed uh, within women than in men. Um, and actually most of the um, uh, major innate functions, the B and T lymphocytes, the mast cells, the macrophages, um, and the natural killer cells are, are predominantly expressed through estrogen receptors. And with a higher estrogen, uh, with a, um, women have a stronger effect. Um, and the genes encoding for TLR7 uh, and 8 and the interleukin uh, 2 gamma, another immune related factor that also encoded on the X chromosome. So therefore we're having a, a stronger um, uh, response because uh, women have uh, two. And, and whereas often the um, only one is working, the TL7 and TL8 uh, have been shown to be actually active on both of the X chromosomes. Um, and also there are other uh, um, toll light receptors uh, um, which uh, um, are specifically uh, uh, um, more efficient at recognizing viral RNA and DNA um, and women have a higher expression of those, uh, those factors. Can I go on to the next slide please? Now, this gives a, a, a definite advantage to women uh, generally through their uh, immune system and they're swifter at uh, clearing pathogens um, and we've we've seen this within the the risk of cancer in uh, um, between men and women and men's increased risk of cancer has been put down to the fact that women perhaps are, are better at removing the, the the pathogens that might be more uh, um, causative and there's also better survival for women through bacterial and viral diseases and parasites um, and um, once the uh, virus has passed, they have a high immune reactivity, which, which actually has a longer term impact on their ability to, to withstand further infections. 
um, and vaccinations have also been found to have a greater and longer lasting effect in women than in men, which, which may again have uh, um, issues in relation to whether they ever do find a vaccine for this disease. But the disadvantage is that there's a big risk of autoimmune diseases um, and that uh, um, the system can malfunction. And we see this through the thyroid disease, the Crohn's disease, uh, and a lot of the other uh, autoimmune diseases. So women are at a disadvantage because of their system. And also we see that once they hit the menopause, then the, the rapid decline in oestrogen uh, has a big impact on their risk of infections. And that may be why we're seeing in the older old women um, many more uh, um, deaths. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so what, what's the male disadvantage? Um, well, the male disadvantage is, is they're not female. Um, in that uh, the female immunity advantages uh, are, are evident, um, but they're not evident within the men, and so therefore that is a big disadvantage. Um, testosterone was thought to be um, immunosuppressive. Uh, 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 there's new uh, work that's coming out, uh, Novak, uh, um, my study that's come out in 2018, taking a more in vivo look uh, at uh, what's going on within the body, the active body, and it's showing that actually there perhaps is a, a function of testosterone within the immune system, but it is not necessarily um, um, uh, suppressive, uh, more they call it immunomodularity. Um, and uh, the men, because of, of male obesity, uh, we know that um, uh, obese, um, the fat cells have higher levels of ACE2, so there may be a, a, more, a greater viral load within um, overweight men. Uh, and we've already heard also that um, the testes might be a, bi um, a reservoir for the disease. Um, and there is a, a discussion around whether testosterone decreases uh, the uh, major histopathic complexity uh, complex which will therefore impact on the uh, uh, messaging of of the uh, response to infection women have um, uh, oestrogen increases the expression where whereas testosterone may have a de, uh, um, decreasing effect could i have the next slide please so in in summary to, to today's lecture um, been a similar number of confirmed cases um, between men and women, whether that is a testing issue um, or whether there is an equal risk of developing the disease. But once we have got it, um, it, it seems that there are um, many more men that are vulnerable to experiencing the severe form of the disease and have a higher mortality. Um, we've seen that that is, is affected by age, by socioeconomic status, uh, status and race. Um, as to the, the, the full uh, reasons why race is, is a factor beyond the socioeconomic, we don't know. There may be biological factors involved as well, but uh, it's, it's certainly the fact that we're not just looking at the biology of this, that there's many intersectional and social demographic uh, uh, issues that way uh, play as well. However, if we're looking at the biological sex differences, there are many complex issues at play. Um, and and uh, we, we feel that um, our understanding of that uh, risk uh, for men and how these factors interplay is, is just still in its infancy. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you all. Um, that was really excellent and highly interesting. Um, and for our audience, I'd like to say thank you for watching this Trends webinar. We hope you found it useful. The article that Mike and Alan have both written will be available on this webpage once it's published. Um, similarly, we will publish the presentation slides so that you don't need to have our videos blocking off some of the very important graphs. Um, and there will also be other key related content available on the webpage. Um, also, as the statement there says, please feel free to start uh, questions or a discussion in the comments section below. And once again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, Alan, Patricia, and Mike for their time today. And we will now say goodbye. Bye.